So it's my pleasure to introduce you um, to this topic on customer success for long-term growth in the context of uh, customer experience, tech, monetization when evaluating companies' future success. Uh, Peter Weed is the global co-head of McKinsey's growth tech practice uh, since its launch three years ago. They've served 130 growth stage venture-backed companies and their respective VCP investors. Uh, Kent Bennett is a partner in Bessemer's Cambridge office, focusing on investments in big data, uh, infrastructure sectors, and consumer service models. Some of the examples of their companies are Endeka, Vertica, Blue Apron, and Goal.com. This chair? That chair? Okay. I got lots of room now. Your chair is bigger than mine. <laughs> Great. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, in a non-McKinsey style, we decided not to have any slides back there. I, I hope this does not like ruin any expectations. I do have a laptop over there. If you want to be assaulted with uh, words on pages, uh, we, we can do lots of that. <laughs> um, uh, so look, we're here today. Uh, Kent has been um, uh, an investor for quite a while now, doing some pretty amazing things. And we were talking about what might be some interesting um, topics to dig into. And the kind of interesting thing with Kent and I is we both kind of come at this industry from a slightly different perspective. Kent, well, he started on the B2B side, has been doing some pretty amazing stuff on the B2C end. My background, um, uh, before McKinsey, I was a software entrepreneur on the enterprise side. I worked in Microsoft on the enterprise side. And since I've been at McKinsey, I've been spending years working with uh, software companies. And most recently, as I mentioned, working with a lot of growth stage B2B, mostly SaaS companies, right? And so we thought this could be a really interesting way to actually play off of our, our experiences and ask, around one of these topics, let's take consumer, right? Because this is a little bit of the precious snowflake type phenomenon where people are like, you can't predict what's going to be a winner. And I think based on, on Kent's experience, and then let's bounce up against that, some of the things we've been observing in B2B, and, and, and fortunately with your nice background as well, and ask, are there some things that actually are more predictable? And are there some interesting learnings that, that kind of come across? But I don't know if you want to introduce yourself a little bit, Kent. And yeah, so the... Um Intro hit it a little bit, but um, I've been at Bessemer for eight years. Bessemer is the largest venture capital fund in Boston, 1.6 billion, uh, every stage of venture, as well as pretty much every sector. Um, certainly a, a B2B SaaS is probably where we've been externally the most um, uh, noisy, but internally we focus on all aspects of consumer, healthcare, um, et cetera. And my journey at Bessemer was from, I mean, I heard that bio and I kind of laugh because you know, big data, well, that sat six years ago, man. I'm, I'm, I'm all consumer now, babe. Um, so, uh, uh, but uh, at Bessemer, the approach is um, sort of general athlete investors, not necessarily, you know, deep sector background who can dive in and out of various roadmaps is the phrase we use um, and apply, you know, a, a lot of forward thinking, much sort of McKinsey Bain style. I'm from Bain originally, but McKinsey Bain style forward thinking uh, to these sectors so that when we see the incredible deals in the sectors, we, we sort of recognize it. And what's interesting, and we've known each other for a while, but what's been interesting in our conversations um, and, and as I've transitioned from more B2B to B2C investing is exactly what you said. In the B2C world, I think there's this impression that um, the, these B2C unicorns kind of emerge from a volcano where they're born and there's just no predicting them and you can't see them coming and you just got to fire and you know, invest in a bunch of these things and, and hope you get lucky. Um, and coming from the B2B world where Bessemer um, has had a lot of sort of metric driven uh, for, um, sort of formulas for predicting B2B success, we've begun to apply some of the same to B2C and seen some real success there. And so I think it's really interesting to think about how B2C and B2B compare um, in, in what success criteria sort of are shared among the two. Um, well, you know, uh, and, and, yeah. uh, you know, just to kind of dig in on that, I, I really liked, um, as we were kind of talking before, um, you know, you, you feel like there are actually some threads that you look for in B2C businesses. Well, they all feel like precious snowflakes. They're all made of, out of ice, right? right? You know, like what what are those common themes that that 
kind of help pull together those that are successful? Yeah. And so, you know, the, the number one, and I think it sort of gets to the, the biggest myth in B2C investing is you simply cannot buy your way to a big successful consumer product. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, every uh, B2C, or many B2C investors and, uh, and certainly entrepreneurs are very focused on this concept of uh, customer acquisition cost and the, and the idea of how, how quickly do I get paid back there. And it's no surprise because, you know, a bunch of investors are staring at their Excel spreadsheets and, and your, your CAC, your customer acquisition cost, and your payback timing, those are numbers that we can manipulate, build models based off of, and feel, you know, sleep warmly at night thinking, gosh, my CAC and my payback is great. Um, and the reality is, as we've looked at it, no great consumer business, and and another part of the problem is there aren't that many great consumer businesses founded. We're talking about two, three, four businesses a year period uh, domestically that would, that would have sort of a huge consumer impact. But no great consumer business has been built that way. Instead, every great consumer business we've ever been seen has been built in a much simpler way. Okay, today you have some amount of revenue from all your customers. Tomorrow you will have less revenue from those customers because human beings, unfortunately, all churn in the end, right? And we move and we have children and we, you know, we have life changes. So in general, every consumer cohort shows some declining spend over time. So you have a gap. And the question is, how do you fill that, that hole in the bucket? Um, and every great consumer business fills it the same way. Their existing customers love their product so much that because the product market fit is sort of radical in some way, that they go out and tell their friends and they tweet about it and they share it on Facebook and, and drive the growth thusly. And so you get some resting, we call it internally, the resting growth rate of these consumer businesses is positive, um, which is a good thing. Put another way, if you stopped spending on paid marketing entirely, you would still grow. Now, of course, you can spend on paid marketing and grow faster, but when that resting growth rate is positive, we think it's a pretty rare, unique uh, thing in the consumer world, and that's what we look for. And I think there are some comparables in, in B2B. I don't know if you sort of have the, the impression, but. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's interesting, because you know, certainly in B2B, when you get out of the small business, I mean, small business B2B looks a lot like consumer, right? Um, uh, when you get into the enterprise, things tend to get stickier, right? It's harder to change. There's there's a lot of benefits, but it is interesting. You know, the the same complaints come up with um, enterprise buyers as I think consumer, which is, uh, there's all this just structural churn. The company goes out of business. You know, I lost my sponsor. Whatever it is, it's that same type of thing. And so your real question you need to be asking yourself is, are you just throwing up your hand at, at that type of activity? And by the way, as you get smaller and smaller businesses, the more likely some of that's going to occur. Are there some practical things that you can do about it? And I wonder if it's some of the same things that you've observed on the consumer side, but you know, the, the types of things that you do on the enterprise side to solve that, OK, well, let, let's say your problem is the business is going to go <coughs> defunct. Well, what you're really trying to do is build a relationship with whoever the buyer was in the first place, because they're going to go work someplace else. And you'd want, want to get them to go uh, bring you someplace else. In fact, there was a, a really fantastic small business software company who, when you actually looked at the real churn that they were achieving, it was very small. Because while they were doing retail storefront software, and retailers churn fast, right? But the cash register should stay there. But the same person who was doing that, what do they go do? They go build another one. Maybe even in the same space. Yeah, they went bankrupt on that one, but they essentially continue to get their revenue streams. Or if you take the other, other side, which is um, you, you take a look at the, hey, I lost my sponsor type issue, right? Well, this is actually more of a, am I proving to this person's broader ecosystem? In the enterprise side, what do we do? We give metrics. We, we, we help them tell their boss why it's being successful. So if that person goes away, the boss is asking for that same report. Well, where's the larger the you know community around that person that you're convincing it's great? So if they are looking to churn, all of a sudden it's right. actually sticky for a broader reason. Yeah, and it's not rocket science, and it's the and it's and we've seen the same thing. And we're investors locally in a business called Toast, which sells to the restaurant industry. And everybody knows that the restaurant industry is the worst industry on the planet, as they all you know told me when I invested. And um, the churn would be massive. Well, it turns out, you know, you churn the restaurant, but the stove is still there, and a new restaurant opens in its place. And if the product is fundamentally fantastic, 
then the new owner, maybe a different owner, will, will want to turn on the same, the same technology in the same spot. In B2C, I think you see this um, more starkly, more dramatically. Consumers just don't care at all about firing the products they don't like. And so give them two seconds of an excuse, their credit card expires. And if the product is crappy, they're gone. I mean, you'll never hear from them again. If the product is fantastic, they will climb through the desert to sort of get to you, and you want to make that as easy as possible for them. Um, but so this, this I mean, it's, it, we hear people say a product market fit a lot, but I think this fundamental force of radical product market fit is still not emphasized as much as it should be, especially in businesses where you do have the ability to pull levers and drive some growth. Um, for the short term, I think that can be intoxicating and can mask the long term sort of um, you know, rot of a, of a product that's not fantastic. How do, you, how do you look at and metric these businesses to both figure out the product market fit and then whether or not they've got the health across the rest of the operations? Yeah, um, well, so, you know, and again, B2C, B2B, very similar. I mean, I think fundamentally we're looking at resting growth rate. So does the product just grow? And then we start to look at can you efficiently grow beyond that with paid marketing? So can you get efficient payback on paid acquisition? Um, you know, details, but we like products that have positive margins. Um, there are some negative margin products that have you know, come and gone and been popular at times, but we think that fundamentally if a product starts off with negative margins and there isn't just a dead obvious plan to get it to positive margins, that unfortunately, if you find radical product market fit and you're growing as many of these consumer businesses do, not 100% a year, but like five, six, seven, eight hundred percent a year for three years, your margins aren't going to improve while that's happening, right? That is, you're just flying off of a cliff trying to trying to improve your margins, and it's not going to happen when you're having to open, you know, to triple the capacity next year that you have this year. So, if we don't have positive margins on day one, we're we're very nervous, and often we'll hear somebody say something like, "Well, as soon as our machine learning kicks in, like our margin margins will be positive," and we're like, "Okay, well." Let's, let's talk then, because until then, we're terrified. Um, but that's, I think that's it. So rest, resting growth rate, efficient paid acquisition, if you've got that uh, option, is great. Some products are going to have such a low lifetime value that they can only rely on their organic resting growth rate. And then you know, positive margins that lead to a positive lifetime value. So well, let me tell you how, how I look at it B2C, or B2B, because I think there's, there's a lot of similarities here. And, and maybe what we're saying is there's some fundamental ways that you want to look at any business. And by the way, one of the interesting things that we were debating, and you can go look at this yourself, is like even go to NRF. NRF publishes their Fast 100 or whatever every year. They just did it here in January. And um, take a look. Where have they gotten funding? How much money have they taken? Um, I was shocked when we were looking at this list, and a very significant portion of this list, much more than you would see on the B2B side, have taken little to no funding. And it actually, I think, emphasizes what you're getting at, which is there's too many consumer businesses that have had an old mantra, which is, is about attracting as many users as possible, and not having something that is really valuable and people will pay you for on day one. Whereas if you actually find something that people are willing to pay you for very early on, you might actually, if you can do all the rest of the consumer business really well, you may be able to take very limited amounts of capital because the cash that you're throwing off from the core business and the viral growth that you're getting from everywhere else actually allows you to take off. Now, Will that work everywhere? Probably not. There are certain consumer businesses that look like you're building you know, a, a Hyperloop uh, you know, system where you've got to have a tremendous amount of capital expenditure. But the question is, is, is that, should that be the case for, for all these businesses? And certainly the evidence would suggest way more than B2B that, um, that it's not the case. On the B2B side, it's interesting, right? I've done this, this big piece of work that took a look at what are successful B2B businesses look like? Um, and what you observe is that, let's say that there's a few times in your lifespan of a business, right? You're founding it, you get product market fit, and then what are you trying to get? You're trying to get through the growth phase to hopefully get to an, to an exit. Um, well, once you enter that growth phase, which is you've proven the product, right? Uh, when you're getting up to say 50 million ARR, what you observe, and if you look back um, at, the, at the history of, of software businesses, is that if you want to grow 10 times more from that, that point, um, you have to have built a business by that point that can achieve and sustain, at least for the forward kind of two to three years, 50% or higher growth rates. Which, by the way, once you get to 50 million, starts to be challenging. 
And when I say it's important to do that, in the last 35 years for software businesses, more than half of software businesses, by the time they made 50 to 100 million, they were growing through that path there at 50% or more, grew 10 times more. Almost none of all the remaining software businesses grew 10 times more. Um, well, then you layer on top of that the fact that valuations today more than they were three years ago. If you went three years ago and you, you correlated valuations, it was purely growth. Today, about 25% of the correlation goes to the efficiency of that growth. And so if you say, I am in an environment where I'm going to be burning cash potentially to do this, you have this, it's something that we call zero burn growth rate, but it's this concept of the resting heartbeat of the business, right? You have an existing subscription business off the cash that it generates. How much growth can you get at, right. at a baseline, right? So you're starting to break this, this business down into its pieces between the resting heartbeat and the efficiency of that growth engine. And if you look at the underlying you know, things that are driving that for those businesses on the enterprise side, most of them have a reasonably good you know, uh, cash generation. There are some that are you know, human-aided for some reasons or have really high you know, serving costs. So, but for most of them, they're going to throw off a bunch of cash from their existing business. So the real question becomes, how efficient are you on the other side? Which is essentially my logo acquisition efficiency and my retention or you know, churn and, and upsell, cross-sell yep. efficiency, right? And it's, it's interesting. It, when you, at least the, the businesses that I spend a lot, a lot of time with, they emphasize that first piece, the logo portion of it. But it's very interesting, this whole concept of how much should I invest on the other side. And part of the reason we decided for the, the topic of this conversation was around you know, this whole retention, churn management, this type of thing. It seems to be low on Maslow's hierarchy. Is that the, is that the same that you see in the, in the consumer side? Or is that just something that we're observing on the, the enterprise? Side? Well, I would say by number, absolutely. The, the vast majority of consumer businesses we see are much more focused on paid acquisition and sort of that, that piece. And that's because if they haven't fundamentally got a great product or they haven't focused on the core retention, um, then uh, they, they're suffering because of that. And they've gotten themselves stuck in this, I have to spend to acquire to stay above water and maybe grow. And the problem that, that you see with the 50 million ARR SaaS businesses that many consumer businesses see, and it tends to be, um, unfortunately, often uh, you know, around the time some of them begin to think about going public or exiting, uh, is that at the margins, they just don't have more opportunities for efficient acquisition. You can't hire more salespeople to call more of your prospect businesses, you've got it covered. And so when you've sort of maxed out on the sort of marginally efficient acquisition opportunities, what's left? Um, now, if you've got instead an incredible retention at your core, well, first of all, you've got a smaller gap to fill every month to grow because you've got less churn. You can get more upsell from your existing customers. Um, and, and I think importantly, those customers are out promoting you. So. At some of our best um, you know, SaaS and consumer businesses, the majority of the leads they get, or the new customers, are coming in organic ways because people are, are hearing directly about great products or they're reading online. Um, and so it's, uh, I, I think there's a trap, though. And I, and I know there's some prospective investors in the audience. I think investors bring this transactional mindset, and often entrepreneurs, to, um, to these enterprises where they Think um, they think in Excel, Excel sheets, and it's not because they're you know they're not uh, you know focused on great customer love. It's just you're so stressed and busy, and what is the next thing I can do to sort of affect change at my business? And it's so much easier to do the math on paid acquisition, paid acquisition and payback. Like the investments you make in core retention and product are often fuzzier, harder ROI to sort of capture. Well, how do you even, how do you even metric it? I mean, when you think of churn, I feel like there's this constant debate of yep. like, how do we even measure it? And especially if you've got a business got, got a freemium component to it and a paid component, like how do you yeah. deal with them? How do you even think about? I, I, you know, I, I think churn is one of the m most abused metrics, you know, in investing period. Um, and it's really sharp how stupid of a metric it is in the consumer world. And so, um, you know, just to just to take a hypothetical example, let's say I'm, I'm building a dog food company, right? And uh, I get some new customers. Uh, in week one, um, you know, probably if I'm a typical consumer product, a quarter of those customers, it's just not going to work. Uh, you know, it just didn't. You know, or the 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 
the new hotel concept you sold them. Like, it's just not what they were looking for, for whatever reason. Consumers are a vast and very different population. And so you lose a lot of people right away. It's because consumers, they don't like do a long investigative sales cycle where they pilot the thing. They just, they buy the one of them and then they see. Um, and they're gonna go away. So by definition, your fastest churning cohort, you know, group of, your, of customers are gonna be your most recent customers in almost every consumer business in history. And so if you accelerate your growth, which means you get proportionally more new customers in your customer set, what will happen to your churn? It will spike, right? So churn, I've just told you, is like a positive indicator for accelerating growth in consumer businesses, right? What is much, so I, I find churn to be totally useless in, in B2C as a, as a concept to, to think about. Uh, I find it much more useful to think about cohorts. And so I've got customers, they trial with me initially, they stick with me with some predictable weight. Um, what I'm really looking for is do they flatten out and even then grow over time. So six months in, am I getting really, really sticky with those customers? On a cohort level, do I get really smooth retention um, and even upsell at the end as so they find ways to find it's interesting that you're more. going that way with the expansion. I, you know, on the enterprise side, certainly you have this big emphasis and, and um, uh, people talk about wanting to have, I don't know if, if uh, folks in the audience, um, they've heard terms like net churn and gross churn. On the enterprise side, essentially what that means, gross churn, you could do it on a logo or a dollar basis, but on a dollar basis would be, hey, for all the things that are up for renewal right now, how many of them came back and renewed, right? Whereas a net churn would also include your expansion. Right? So if you sold more units of it, you sold uh, another product along to your existing customers. So a net churn number essentially is, um, it tells you the whole business of your existing base, how, how much more is that? And, and folks are saying, hey, I'd love to get 110, 115, it would be amazing if I could get that type of uh, expansion regularly. But I think frequently I hear in, when I go into consumer conversations, you know, they're only gonna buy this much. You know, like if I'm, you know, Dollar Shave Club, they only buy this much from me every single um, you know, period, there is no expansion. But I think you've got maybe a different perspective on that. Well, I think it's, it, it, you know, for many that's the case. I think, you know, what's fun for me is to think back 10 years ago, right, when MapQuest was the top map product in the world and, you know, the world was very, very different. There well, aren't- You're saying that, that I'm supposed to use something else? Yeah, I've got a new one days? for you. Okay. Um, but, you know, these consumer businesses, do not last. I mean, you know, it is the hardest thing in the world that I, in the investing world I've seen is to build a consumer business that's gonna be alive 10 years from now. And I think by definition, the ones that will be, will have significantly expanded their product roadmap in some way along that path. Now, maybe they're just trading, you know, you know, a for B, product-wise, but I think the really successful ones, and Amazon is like, you know, probably the greatest example we'll ever see um, of this, have significantly expanded their consumption. Uh, it's incredibly rare. I mean, once you get a consumer to love you, but they're in a routine with you, to convince them to spend a lot more money with you over time is, is very, very, very hard. Um, but some businesses do it. Some of the best consumer businesses in the world we see do it, and they do it for um, a couple reasons. This, the customers who have stuck around after the first period are real evangelists. They really love this product, and they, and they often will seek to find ways to consume more of it. Um, you know, if you expand your view to the consumer cohort of not just that consumer, but their entire family, often, now we can almost never do the math on this, but often if you can do that anecdotally, you know that among their group of peers and friends and family that they are consuming more of your product if they really, really love it. Um, and so I think, you know, product expansion is one way to think about it. Increased consumption over time for certain products. You know, Uber is an example where um, I think over time, after they've gotten through the sort of initial churn of, of a one-time user who's, you know, travels in from a town where they don't need Uber and then they go back home. But with stable customers, people start thinking, gosh, I could sell my car and I could consume more of this over time. Um, and, then, and then for others, just thinking about how this becomes a pervasive thing in your social circle and the, and the sort of net negative um, family cohort churn there, I think would be an equivalent concept. So, you know, the interesting thing that comes with these cohorts, Dan, it's, I feel like I get into these debates all the time. And I was like in a board meeting yesterday where it was debated yet again, um, which is, do I look at customer lifetime value um, or do I look at something more like the magic number? And you know, on, the, on the enterprise side, essentially what I mean by this is, 
if you know that your you know, average lifespan of a customer is going to be seven years, you can say, well, I estimate the total value of this customer once I have them is going to be X. The other way to look at it would be, you know, there's this concept of magic number that says, I'm going to ignore the long tail. I just want to know how quickly I pay back the amount of the sales and marketing that I, that I had. Um, and if that's short enough, I should feel pretty comfortable about these because mm -hmm. all SaaS businesses, unless you're pretty screwy, are not going to be churning too badly. Like, how, how do you think about that debate on the consumer, consumer side? Well, so again, for these incredibly rare, but the only ones I really want to invest in consumer businesses um, that, that just grow, that have a resting growth rate that is positive. If you limit yourself to lifetime value, you're really not doing the full math because you're saying, wow, this, you know, this person I acquired for this product is worth $50 to me, discounted present value of all the future margins that are going to come in. OK, $50, that's, you know, that's not great. Um, but if it turns out that person is going to go out and bring in two of their friends who are going to bring in four of their friends who are going to bring in eight of their friends, well, that math gets really stupid really fast. This person is worth you know, $5,000 for you. I was, this is I, like Slack, right? This is like Slack. This is like I was an early um, customer of Blue Apron, and there are you know, several thousand customers who have descended from people who have invited, who've invited, who've invited people, right? So, um, so I think lifetime value for the best-in-class consumer products ends up being not that helpful, um, whereas in enterprise, I can see it as mu a much more helpful concept because enterprises don't have the same sort of viral you know, organic acquisition beyond. Um, uh, you know, but if you have a consumer product that is not one of these, and your customers, you know, let's say you're selling acne medication, and people probably aren't going to go scream from the rooftops about it, then it's critical to know what your lifetime value is, how quickly you're going to be paid back on that, what multiple overtime you're going to get on the marketing spend up front, because that's going to be a gating factor for the return on equity in your business. Well, it almost sounds like you're, you're making the argument that there's something similar but done in a different way on the consumer side, which is that when you think of your net churn, it's really what is my viral add-on that I'm getting and how healthy is a business. By the way, I, I will, if anybody wants to come argue with me, I also do not like lifetime value on the enterprise side. We can talk about why, why that is at some other point. But it's very interesting, because I think you're getting at this, this question of, so there's similarly the churn like a gross churn, but also on a net churn basis, is there a different way of looking at it, which is how viral, how much are you getting out of your existing customer base? And is there a way to measure that? so that you can actually um, understand the true efficiency. Because you know how much it costs you to capture that first customer, but how much does it cost you to get all of their network as right. well? Yeah, and it's funny. But we, we talk about this in theory. And in, in my experience, every time I'm in one of these situations, it's so good, OK? You can't believe it. And if you were to plan based on it, it would seem insane, right? It would say, oh my gosh. We can afford to spend 10 times the individual LTV of this customer to acquire a customer, um, and we're still getting efficient payback at the margin. And so it, not to mention, it's just really, really hard to track like, how this virality truly plays out over time just because of the limitations of like, graph databases and you know, internally at the companies, they can't do this really well. And so what ends up happening is they, they end up using maybe a lifetime value metric as just sort of a guideline for you know, marketing spend at the margin. Um, and, uh, and that's probably a pretty conservative way to manage a business, you could probably get much more aggressive with much fancier math. Um, but then, you know, I think we don't have enough experience with how these products mature over time to know when that math might turn on you, what the signs of that might be, and, and how, how far over your skis you might be at that moment of paid acquisition. So not to geek out. Yeah, well, and so on you, but. As, you're, as you're looking at um, these consumer businesses and you, you know, I think you're, you're clearly convincing me and hopefully others the importance of why the retention and focusing on the success is, is very important. What are you looking for in these businesses in terms of the investments that they've made that give you an indication that they are going down the right path? And you know, some of the things, some of the questions that I often get on the, on the enterprise side are going to be things like, hey, what portion of my sales time should be spent hunting versus farming? You know, should I split hunters versus farmers and have customer success managers? Um, you know, uh, comp model, like are these guys quoted like you know the other ones? Are there similar types of questions that you are looking for for the really smart consumer businesses where you're like, these guys get it. Right. They're going to succeed versus the ones that aren't. Right. I think it's, it's people who are just fundamentally focused on product quality. But let me break that down into a couple dimensions. These incredible products should be um, 
time savers. They should be easier to consume than, than some of the products they're competing with. They should have value to them. So they should, in an ideal world, save you money relative to the alternatives. They should be better quality. Sometimes the Shake Shack burger just has to taste better or it doesn't work, right? Um, and then they need to have um, what I call like the fuzzies, um, some set of it's an authentic brand. Like this is a company that really does care about um, their customers in the world, um, that they're a fun brand to be associated with. It's a, often a beautiful brand because they care about visual design and the aesthetics of it. Um, the companies that are focused on anything but those aspects of just product quality before they put the marginal dollar into paid acquisition um, are the ones that, uh, well, we're interested in the ones who are focused on the fir former first, right? So, you know, you talk to them about their paid acquisition, they just can't be bothered. They'd much rather focus on, um, you know, the new thing they're putting in at the new facility or the incredible taste of the new thing that's just come off the line, et cetera. Um, so that's the thing. And, and you can just see it in their eyes. Like, fundamentally, they're typically in the consumer world solving a problem that they had as this consumer. They're a big consumer of their product, and they want it to be more awesome. And that's what they're spending all their time doing. Well, thank you very much. I think we've uh, blown, blown through our time here. We, Great. I'm sure, could talk about this forever. And if, if any of you have uh, any questions, I'm sure that our contact information is... Um, part of this, but uh, again, uh, Kent uh, and, and the stuff he's been doing at Bessemer, pretty amazing, um, you know, applying a lot more rigor, I think, and actually you see it in the performance of the businesses that, that you've been participating with, and there aren't a ton of folks that are doing consumer, but the folks that seem to do it, you know, they, they are, are figuring it out, um, and if you have enterprise Great. questions, you can always come find me later. So. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Bye, guys.